right. All right, now we're on the record. Yeah, I'm going to go over here and say, got it. <laughs> Is it coming? Okay. Good oh. afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kay Simon. I am the president-elect of the Capella University uh, ISPR chapter, and I want to welcome everyone who has logged into our session. We have a okay. really interesting presentation with Dr. Oh. Fred Frank and Tim Brock. Of course, if you see Tim Brock, he is definitely one of our Capella's uh, facilitators and professors. But just to give you a little bit of a background about our ISPI, we have a brand new student leadership team and we have a few of us online today um, who are very much eager and excited to have all of you here to talk about the different attributes of ISPI and how to communicate with us, learn the benefits of our organization. One of the things is getting these quarterly conversations um, we have the professionals, some of the best of the best talking about ISBI and all the things dealing with um, the different 10 steps and other theories that connect to the ISBI. Not that just being one of the benefits, but also we're really interested in getting to know you and getting to know what you're interested in for our chapter specifically. Um, we have sent out a survey and that survey entails content around knowing whether you're interested in learning about the incentives of the program, if we can help you with your actual um, programs in itself and how we can help you with understanding theories. So if you're interested in learning more about the Capella ISPI chapter, you can always send me an email and I'll put that in the chat. But then also too, what I would suggest is if you are a current member of uh, the Capella University, you can go to our website and you would see a list of the benefits as well as the link. Membership is free. So that means there's no excuse for why you can't have all the benefits that Capella S ISPI program has um, because it allows you to not only network, learn more, but it adds value to your curriculum as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna stop doing the spiel on why you should sign up with us, but I will definitely now do the introduction of our speakers. First, I'll talk about Dr. Frank Fo. He is an as associate professor of marketing at the University of Missouri at St. Louis. He has published several articles in major marketing journals and presented at national and international academic conferences. His work has appeared in the Journal of Marketing, Journal of Personal Selling and Sales Management, Human Performance, and Performance Improvement. He currently serves as a electoral review board of the Journal of Marketing Theory and Practice, and he serves as an assistant editor of the associate, my apologies, associate editor of the performance improvement quarterly, which is also mm -hmm. let me it's also a magazine that comes out of the ISBI if you're really interested. <laughs> Prior to joining academia, he he gained sales, marketing, and management experience in the pharmaceutical and medical equipment industries. In addition to the academic research and teaching, he has helped American and Chinese companies improve their business performance through consulting and advisory efforts. He's also the founder of the ISBI Chinese chapter, China chapter, and has served as the vice president of membership slash marketing of the ISBI St. Louis chapter. He may be reached at an email, which I will also put into the chat for your reference. Now, getting on to our Capella, Capella's own, we have Dr. Tim Brock, <laughs> the Chief Cons Facilitation Officer at the ROI Institute, which is Return of Investment Institute, and the leading source of ROI competency building, implementation support, networking, and research, where he helps organizations implement the ROI methodology at more than six thousand organizations in and in over 70 countries. In addition, he has his doctoral and advanced doctoral uh, program facilitator 
facilitator membership at Capella, like I said, and he is a, facil a faculty member at the United Nations System Staff College in Turn, Italy. Dr. Brock has been a frequent presenter at international and regional profession professional conferences. He has written performance improvement and evaluation chapters for two healthcare yeah. books, one chapter on in instructional design and performance outcomes in medical education and other chapters in the healthcare simulation books. In addition, Dr. Brock has published multiple articles on performance improvement and evaluation topics and has been invited to speak at conferences around the world on varying topics. He is a founding president of the ISPI Central Florida chapter and a founding member of the Capella University virtual chapter. Dr. Brock has served on many society committees and has been the chair of the award chapter partnership and the CPT credential committees which is, he's also the current chair. He holds a PhD in education with a specialization in training and performance improvement from Capella University and is a certified performance technologist, a certified ROI professional, certified performance improvement facilitator, and a certified designer of training with a specialization in simulation <laughs> and lab. Dr. Brock is retired from the Air Force and having been served as both enlisted as an officer in ranks. He is also retired from Lockheed Martin, where he was a human performance, performance system engineer and manager of their global learning and performance team. I don't know about y'all, but I see a lot of accolades from both of them. And with that, I would say we have a really good presenters today. So um, with that, I will introduce Dr. Brock and Dr. Fo to now start their presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks. And I, I got to tell you, I'd, I'd be really impressed with that last guy that you read about if I didn't know him. So let's um, let's go ahead and get started here. <laughs> um, and um, Dr. Fu. Why don't you go ahead and kick us off, since this was really your study that you got going over in, in um, China and you invited me to be a part of. If sure, you're okay sure. with the state, <laughs> let's get this thing going. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction, Kay. Uh, it's a really um, an honor to be invited, and it's a great pleasure to uh, share uh, the research I conducted with uh, Dr. Tim Brock and Hongyi, you know, our co-author in China, uh, to you. Um, I have been uh, working with uh, SPI for about 12, 13 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we introduced uh, SPI HPT performance improvement to China. Uh, at that time, the SPI president was uh, Dr. Judy Hale. Yep. And I heard from you guys that uh, Dr. Judy Hill was the last presenter uh, to the chapter. So it was uh, right. it's a great, great uh, pleasure uh, to follow Dr. Hill. Um, she's not only a good friend of mine, she's also a mentor. I, I learned from her. I work with her. I really respect her. So with that joint effort, we introduced... Um, performance improvement to China around uh, 2011, 2010. And afterwards, uh, it was booming uh, in, the, in the Chinese market. Uh, today, uh, performance improvement become the keyword uh, for uh, training, for HR, for business, for managers uh, in different industries all across the nation. Uh, it's really, uh, I was really impressed when I witnessed the whole uh, process. Uh, now I serve on the SPI board uh, for about five years. Uh, I work with uh, Dr. Tim Brock on the CPT committee. Uh, Tim is the, the chair of the committee. I work as the board liaison with CPT. And I travel mm -hmm. frequently uh, 
to China and witness all the progress they made on the other side of uh, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so starting from about 10 years ago, now they translate many of our literature from English to Chinese, uh, including uh, the behavioral engineering model by um, Gilbert. Uh, they use this theoretical framework as the basis to develop tools for their own practice. Uh, up to today, I think there are thousands of performance improvement projects have been developed in China, and each year they submitted to our outstanding intervention award application. And mm -hmm. so far, they have earned dozens of awards. And this year, I think at least 10 applications were submitted. I'm sure some of them will win award. Uh, this really yes, um, encouraging to see how ISPI, HPT make a difference um, in this emerging uh, economy. Uh, one particular theory uh, our friends in China are interested in is behavior engineer model. And they develop these tools based on uh, the idea, the prediction of the theory that if you focus on um, factors at the environment, instead of at the individual level, you are able to improve individual and organizational performance dramatically without adding too much resources. Well, if you are, right, I think Dr. Tim Brock will reveal the literature, but briefly let me tell you the idea of the BEM or the behavior engineer, engineer model is that the factors related to data, instrument, and the incentive, we call them the environmental factors, they account for, they combine accounts for about 75% of the impact mm -hmm. on job performance. And the individual level factors, including knowledge, including capacity and the motive, they account for 25%. So mm -hmm. in the past, you know, before performance improvement, many Chinese company, they focus on individual factors. They spend so much resources on training to improve knowledge, to motivate their individual workers. Mm -hmm. The idea from the behavior engineer model is that, wait a minute, before you, you know, focus on this individual factors, let's take care of the factors at the environmental levels. Let's provide data to our workers. Let's give them feedback. Let's make them clear about the expectation. Give them the tools they need. Provide the resources they need and the redesign incentive. Just by doing that, from industry to industry, from company to company, they're able to improve job performance significantly. Yeah. You know, I was, I had the pleasure to read many of their award application. You know, I had a pleasure to talk to the executives uh, in many companies. This happened, you know, over and over again. But each time when I look at those results, and when I look at their presentation, they talk about 75% on the top three level, top three level factors and 25% on the individual level factors. I could not help but thinking, okay, that's great, that's reasonable. But uh, all of these numbers are from Western context. The theory, the behavior engineer model was developed in the US. And many of the empirical evidence collected are from the US and Europe, all of these are Western context. But I mean China. Now this is a non-Western context, it's an emerging economy. Now many conditions are different. To what extent the theory is still applicable, still relevant here in China as well in the, in, as in the US? What is the validity of this theory in this new different cultural setting? So I searched the literature, I didn't find much uh, you know, findings from a non-Western contact. Well, we just identify a gap, a research gap. So you are a doctor, <laughs> you are trained in, the, in this profession, you know when you identify a performance gap, that's the aha moment. 
that gave us a wonderful opportunity to design a study to close this research gap, to explore the interesting topic, to answer the question, you know, to what extent uh, the behavioral engineer model are applicable, um, are relevant in a non-Western uh, contact in China, you know, to what extent is robust across different industries. Uh, you know, that's that's so interesting. So we, we decided to, um, uh, to start the project uh, before 2018, and we actually collect data in 2018 from 423 Chinese professionals, and we tested uh, our hypothesis. So that's basically the background, uh, the motivation of this study. Um, so now I'd like to uh, give the stage to my co-author, my good friend, Dr. Tim Brock, to go through uh, the theoretical foundation and some literature review. Yeah, absolutely. Now, here are the hypotheses that the study sought to look at related to the behavior engineering model. And again, as Dr. Fu was mentioning, he says, what's the correlation between the different factors in China as it relates to the Western uh, uh, culture out there? Is there a difference? So he's looking for evidence of comparing the the results of a study in China against the work done primarily by by Gilbert Dean and Salovich trying to replicate that study. The other thing they wanted to look at was is there a difference among the industries within China? Uh, the third thing they wanted to look at was is there a difference in perspectives between the managers and the non-managers? And then the final thing is they looked at other demographics to to go through uh, you know are there by age and you know different types of backgrounds and things so that was the intent of the study now to to understand the significance of this behavior engineering model we under, we have to understand its purpose and the context for its use because the behavior engineering model unfortunately in a lot of organizations is used in isolation and outside the area of of how Gilbert intended it to be implemented. So this here is a picture of Thomas Gilbert. You can see he was a happy man. He didn't have a lot of hair, but he was still happy. All right. Uh, but what he looked at is there were three foundational principles for our profession to do what he called worthy engineering. That's what his book was all about. And that's what we should be about. How do we engineer worthy performance. What does he mean by that? Well, the three principles that you're looking at are here. First of all, whenever you're looking at something, it has to have utility, okay? It has to be useful in the real world. You know, there's a lot of great theories out there. You got great charts and graphs and colors and everything and arrows, but they don't do you any good in the real world, the theoretical. He says the first thing is utility. It has to be useful in the real world to solve real problems. And that's what our profession, human performed technology, is all about. We are about solving complex problems. We're about solving those type of problems out there that, you know, it's hard to get your arms around. The other principle he talked about was pars parsimony, which means simplicity. It's got to be simple. A lot of different theories and different, you know, uh, models and things out there are really complex and you're scratching your head, you don't even know where to start with them. He said, it's gotta be simple. You gotta get rid of all necessary baggage, keep it down basic. And then the third one he talked about was elegance. It's gotta be coherent. It's all the different parts of it has to fit together. So that's what we wanna be looking at so we have a unity of our approach to things that is simple and it's also useful. Makes sense, doesn't it? I'd, I'd want to do something like that. That's why he's smiling, because he was smart. He really figured that out. All right, so now what we want to do is, here's his book. You can see in the title of his book what he talked about, which Dr. Fu already mentioned, Human Competence, Engineering Worthy Performance. So here's a couple of things that he talked about when he was in 1978. Now, I hope all of you uh, have this book and you've read it and you use it. I mean, I have a copy of mine on the desk, and it's really worn, and I, I re reference it all the time. I like how Gilbert positioned 
what we're about in this title. Like I said, that what we do is engineer worthy performance. We are about worthy performance, not just performance improvement. Now, we say we're about performance improvement, but the issue is, is where we make our money with the executives is we demonstrate the benefits of our efforts exceeds the costs. That's what makes it worthy, all right? So everybody out there talks. You listen to different organizations and different different types of uh, uh, models and things. Everybody's talking about how they improve performance, remember? Quality, everybody says we're about improving performance, but worthy performance is what makes us different. That's what we want to be doing. How are we different? So this means that we are not only to provide evidence about the value of the performance results that we improve, but also a balance against the cost to get there, because this is how executives think. And this is what resonates with the executives over in China, because they understand this. They get this, okay? So we want to make sure whenever we present these things that we present it with this in mind also. Here's a couple of uh, topics that uh, are quotes I have from Gilbert's book out there. And the obvious question that you look at, it says, competent people are those who create valuable results without using excessively costly behavior. If I was a boss, I'd be all for that, right? If I came in here and you said, hey, boss, I can save you $2. Well, how much is it going to cost me? It's going to cost me four. Well, I don't think I'm going to go for that. So what we want to be looking at is we want to be looking at Gilbert's three economic corollary theor theorems that guide us. That's the background that we want to use to understand the, the, the behavior engineering model so that you can truly appreciate what the results of this study is telling you. So engineering worthy performance is about the economics of the costs associated with engineering valuable performance. So when you think like this, you are singing on the same song sheet that the executives do. We harmonize with them rather than sing a different song. You know, we keep talking about changing behaviors and doing things. All they see is cost. We're costing them money. We want to be in the same song sheet as them showing how it's worthy performance. So we only do this when we talk about performance. And, you know, they're going to be looking at us and saying, okay, you're talking about performance. I'm all for improving performance. But how much is this going to cost me? We got to get ahead of that. Okay. So here's what we're talking about. Okay. Here's the formula that Gilbert created for worthy performance. You didn't know we had a formula in our profession, did you? There's math. And it looks complicated. And people really are impressed that, that when we have a formula because they think we're smarter than we really are. But we are smart because we understand all the variables here, right? So what we're looking at here is Gilbert's de definition of worthy performance. It is a function of valued accomplishments that we typically call results divided by the cost to get there. Makes sense. Like a benefit-cost ratio. Now, accomplishments to Gilbert were a unit of measure, and those unit of measures are like quality, quantity, productivity, or costs. Now, notice how Gilbert defines the central focus of what we do. It's not about our process or what we change. It is about what accomplishments executives get in return for their money. It's about engineering worthy performance. And this is bec important because the behavior engineering model is embedded in this formula, which I'll show you here very shortly. But I want to get this theorem introduced to you because it helps us to understand what the behavior engineering model is about. Okay, any questions about this so far? This makes sense? Okay, a thumbs up and I had a head scratch. Okay, gotcha. All right. <laughs> So here we go. This theorem is about the role of management in engineering worthy performance. Okay, this is this is what we're looking at. This is what Gilbert's talking about here. Here we find what most people associated with Gilbert, his behavior engineering model that you see here. Now, we like to do our analysis using this model to define root causes. It's fun. We enjoy that kind of stuff. 
Accomplishment shortcomings are the result of problems in either the system, the environmental support, or in the behavior of the people. Now notice the last sentence that we have here. The ultimate cause is that there is a problem in the management system. He doesn't blame people, it's in the management system, which is what Dr. Fu said earlier. You know, it's the top part we're looking at here on the behavior engineering model. So the behavior engineering model is only part of this management theorem that we're talking about here. Oh, goody, looky here, another formula. All right, here is the management system that Gilbert was referring to, okay? The worthy performance on the left of the formula comes from his core theorem, all right? Where worthy performance, which is the AW, not ANW, don't go there to get a root beer, it's AAW, okay, is the ratio of the, the valued accomplishments in monetary terms, that's the AV, to the costly behaviors, that's the BC, to achieve the valued accomplishments. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about the behavior engineering model with a performance analysis, but we typically don't see anything on using it as a part of economic analysis. So we as human performance technologists, when we're talking about the behavior engineering model, we should be looking at, yeah, we want to be doing these things, but where's the most of the cost? The most of the cost is affected by the management systems because they control what goes here, right? What happens here? That's all costs. And we do these things, we manipulate these things down here to achieve value, accomplishments. And that value should exceed the cost of getting there to have worthy performance. It's just common sense, right? Makes sense. So you good with that? So we what we want to do is we want to make sure that we position the behavior engineering model as a tool that management can use to manage and control the costs associated with improving and sustaining human performance in organizational results. And what it does is it identifies those areas that will have the biggest impact in improving human performance. And you're going to see from the studies that we're going to be showing you that the studies in the U.S. culture and what the studies in the China culture shows where you get your biggest bang for your buck, okay? So if we want to help our customers and clients see the value of our effort to engineer worthy performance using measures that matter to them on programs that matter to them, we must show the economics of our performance improvement efforts. So here's why that's important. I said all of this to say this, okay? It is not correct to view Gilbert's behavior engineering model as simply a performance improvement diagnostic tool. As you can see here, it is a behavioral cost-focused performance improvement diagnostic tool. This puts the model in the right perspective to serve the purpose it was intended to serve. Managers want to know the most effective and economical choices they have to improve human and thereby organizational performance. Managers in the West and in China think the same way when it comes to getting business results. So we are selling ourselves and our profession short when we limit our thinking to the BEM, the behavior engineering model, and ignore the other variables that Gilbert's worthy performance formula has for us. And this is also how you should be thinking as you hear the results of the study that we're going to explain, okay, to you that happened in China. And also when you explain the results of your work using the behavior engineering model, when you're explaining the results to your leaderships and your organization. Okay, does uh, that help you up? Make, make, does that make sense? Ask questions. Ask questions. Okay, good. All right. So let's talk about 
some behavioral uh, empirical uh, studies, some baseline studies. This is a busy slide, but it has a lot of data on it, which is good. But at the top, what you see is Gilbert defined his three environmental support factors and his three behaviors and things that reside within an individual, okay? And you notice how they're numbered, and that's how he prioritized them. The ones that are the most important work all the way down. That's how he looked at them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see the bulk of them are in the environmental, the organizational environment. Now, down below is the U.S. empirical studies. Let's see the averages. What do you notice about the studies as far as what's happening with the environmental support and also with the person's repertory behavior? What do you notice from, these, from this data? Doom, 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 doom. I would, I would say that you would have a, you have a higher number of incentives and motivations from the environmental support phase than you do the um the personal and individual space. Yeah, because what you're seeing here is we said earlier that environmental support, you know, had a bigger fact, uh, a bigger impact than this. But look right here, when you take a look at the averages. 71%, maybe 70, 20 is what we're looking at here. Okay. And then if you take a look at each of the studies, look at the ones that we have for data instrument, which is your resources, incentives, how they ranked. You know, the data was the most important one, followed by instruments, followed by incentives. And then we come down here. What was the most important one? You had knowledge. Well, look over here. Modus was a little bit more than capacity, which is a little bit different than what Gilbert looked at. Okay but still pretty close. So the studies seem to bear out what Gilbert was talking about. But the data, the data was the biggest barrier to optimal human performance and the others can, are affected by that or can affect that, okay? So it's important that you understand these this, this baseline data that we have here so that you can understand what we're gonna be talking about when we get to the, the, the study in China. So here is how the study defined these factors. So when Dr. Fu and, and his team, they, they worked with this and they sent this out, here's how they define each one of these terms so that the people taking the, the survey, the questionnaire, were able to answer, okay, this is how we define that term. Okay. So Dr. Fu, you want to take over from here and explain this a little bit more? Sure. Um... Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, what you're looking at uh, is the survey instrument uh, we used in China. And it's exactly the same instrument used by Ding in 1997 as Stockbridge in 2004. We used exactly the same instrument to ensure the results from our study are comparable. It's not a perfect cross-cultural comparison because not only the culture is different, the time are different. The Dean study was conducted in 1997. The Stockwich study was conducted in 2004. And our study was conducted in 2018. So we have more than one differences. However, when we are using exactly the same survey instruments, we have some solid ground to compare mm -hmm. the results and do some important complications and implications. Right. So, so these are the results from um, the US and we compare that with the China study at the bottom, you can see that's the China study 2022. And our hypothesis, the number one hypothesis is will be, will the, the prediction, the, the, the percentage you know, for each and every the factors differ systematically uh, in China as compared to the counterparts in the U.S. So we look at uh, this percentage. Uh, and we can see that in general, the trend still holds in China. That is, 
the environmental support are still far more important than individual mm -hmm. related factors. Uh, remember, in the U.S., in 1997 and uh, Stockwich 2004 both predict the environmental support will account for 75% of the impact on job performance. In China, that's even more. It's more like 85%. It's 84.7, as you can see right here. It's 84.7%. And the individual factor in the U.S. was 25%. In China, this was close to 15%. So this is very interesting. It answers the question we want to ask. Is the validity and the relevance of behavioral engineer model in China are supported? Not only they're supported, we find they're even more powerful. The environmental mm -hmm. support showing stronger impact on job performance than here in the US. Yep. We can then look at the three factors at the, at the environmental uh, level. The data, the data, if you're familiar with uh, Carl Bender's six boxes uh, tool, this is the box number one. It's the data, the feedback, uh, the information. You know, in Dean and the Stockwich study, they both have 35% weight. But in, in the China study, it was close to 50%, it's 49.5%. It's far more significant, far more powerful uh, than their American counterparts. Mm -hmm. That's quite encouraging and is meaningful. I'll we'll talk about the implication later. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, that's very good results we're looking for. Uh, we have the confidence to say, not only in the U.S. and the Europe, we found strong support, empirical evidence for Gilbert's behavior engineering model. Yeah. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, absolutely. What what we did here was we added a study on emerging eco emerging economy. Okay, as you can see here from Stahl and Freer. This was done in 2019 in an Afghanistan. And just for information, uh, Dr. Stahl and Freer are from Capella. As a matter of fact, Dr. Freer was the dissertation advisor for Dr. Stahl. Okay. So they were both on faculty. Well, Dr. Stahl became faculty here later, too. So Capella, 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 everywhere you look. So, <laughs> but look at look at the change in an emergency economy, okay, out there, what the difference was. You still have what? You still have the environmental support as the most important element out there. It's not the people, it's the organization. You know, it's the old line they have out there that, you know, different people said, you know, Rummler and uh, quality. You pick good people against the bad process, the bad process wins every time. Well, that's what we're looking at here. When you put, put good people in a bad environment or an unhealthy environment, the environment wins every time. So this this is also, I think, you know, it reinforces the study of the the validity of the study and also the validity of the model. So let's take a look at those the, what this tells us again. Okay, the high first hypothesis. What, what what does that tell? What did we learn from this? Let's take a look at the data again and tell us how how do you think. The uh, the results of this study did with hypothesis one. Is there a difference? A statistically significant difference between China and the U.S. the West as far as the results that you see here, or they there's really not that much difference. Yeah, there's not that much difference. So that gives us an idea that if if you are if you are a manager in 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 China, you're going to want to you're going to want to put your attention in the the environmental support. But look where you're going to put more emphasis than if you're in the U.S. 
because what's your objectives? You want to minimize costs. So where is the most cost effective uh, place for you to put your money to improve performance? Which goes back to the larger systemic perspective that you know that uh, Gilbert had dealing with the management systems. But this is data. This is solid data. So the top one is still data. Okay, doesn't matter. Now there are a couple. Of, we had a couple other ones. Frank, you guys uh, went into the statistics on this. What did it show? What did the uh, study show about the differences among industries? Was there a difference? You know, hypothesis two to four, well, we're trying to test, uh, you know, whether this significant differ uh, among different industries, different demographic variables, different positions. We found uh, literally no difference among industries. Mm -hmm. This is the theory, the behavior engineering model, model is quite robust. It holds whether you are in a banking industry or your manufacturing, your service, you know, any industry is the same. Yeah. It's the same. There's no significant difference whatsoever. And also, mostly demographic variable do not make a difference either. Whether you are, you know, depend on the, the, the gender, the age, um, the, the tenure position doesn't matter. The theory prediction holds. That's how robust uh, the theory is. I think mm -hmm. the only variable we found um, the significant difference is the, um, the job experience. It appears mm -hmm. that the more experience you have, the more likely you choose the environmental factors. The more likely you choose data. The more likely you choose instrument or resource than individual factors. Yep, yep. In fact, we find that for people who have over 10 years experience, 88% choose environmental factors. Then, you know, other less experience, they have 82. So yep. that tells you that when you have more experience, you probably realize from your own experience how important the environmental factors are. So that makes sense. And also, yeah. age doesn't make a difference. It's only the experience. And the age right. and the job experience are positively related, but still age have no impact. That is so encouraging. You know, it that's is. The, how meaningful uh, these results are. Yeah. So, you know, it makes sense when you think about it. If you've been on the job for 20 years and you know how to do the job, and if there's problems out there, you know, and it ain't me, you know, <laughs> We know how to do our jobs. We know what's going on, but there's something in the organization that's a barrier that's preventing you from applying what you know how to do. And that comes from experience. So here's the implication. One of the implications we saw. Now we talk about other implications of the paper that you all have a chance to get and, and to read. Uh, but when you take a look at H as a an HPT diagnostic tool, the behavior engineering model, it's magic. I consider it's like magic. I love the model. I love the model. So it not only works in the Western culture, it works in China. And we saw the one study that where you work in Afghanistan. Right? Check, check this out. Check out this quote. One of my one of my other favorite authors. This is a book I love too. If you don't have this book by Richard Swanson, you got to get it. It's great. He was the first editor of the Performance Improvement Quarterly, okay, out of the University of Minnesota. Read that quote. Have you seen this happen in your lives? You know, if, if you can't show me the value that something is bringing to the organization, it's going to get cut. It's like the old line out there. When somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're, you know, we got to make some cutbacks around here and we're looking at some different uh, places to do it. Can, can you show us what value you're bringing to the organization? You know, when they come to you and they ask that question, guess what? You made the list. They don't know what value you bring. And do you think they're going to wait around for you to show the value you're going to bring? Nope. They're not going to wait around. 
So you got to be able to show the value you're bringing to the organization early. And using this approach, the behavior engineering model and, the, and Gilbert's work and the other things that we talk about in human performance technology helps us to be proactive to show our value in the organization so that we don't put ourselves on the chalky, chopping block. Here's another one. This is from Gilbert's book. And it's just it makes, it's just common sense, really. If you take a look at Gilbert's book, he said he titled it "Engineering Worthy Performance for a Reason," and that's what we're doing. We're engineering, and engineering is different than just tinkering around and doing things. It's with a purpose. Okay, you're engineering worthy performance, and we've got to make sure that when we go to management. Okay, with our human performance improvement initiatives and things that we show how what what we produced is valued accomplishments. It's worthy performance. Okay. Does this all make sense? Okay, good. We'll get one last question here. Okay. How we got to show our value. This is something that I that we brought up in the paper. Because this was done and all the other studies were done before COVID. By the way, that's a little COVID particle right there for you. It is blown up and it's not that size. All right, you wouldn't be able to see it if it was real. Okay, but um, when we talk about what people prioritize and what's most important to them in the organization, has anything changed? You know, we talk about the terms up there, they talk about the great reset. And they talk about how people don't want to come back to work or they want to do things differently or they want to work from home and a lot of those other things. Well, the question is, is, okay, fine. How would we, how would we evaluate that? How would we diagnose that using the behavior engineering model? And would that affect the priorities that we see in the environmental support and the individual repertoire areas? So I, to me, I think that's a great opportunity for us to take a look at maybe some additional studies to answer that question. What do you think about that? Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. listen, hey, listen, maybe if, if anybody's looking for a project to work on, huh, huh? <laughs> this would be a dandy. <laughs> Just replicate the study. And I'm sure okay. the executive would welcome this. You think Capella would, would, would appreciate having a study like this? Amanda? Yeah, I think so. I'd be curious on, would you anticipate like many changes or do you think the model would stay consistent? The model, is, I think, I think the model will stay consistent. Yeah. It might be, in my opinion, I just think it's a matter of degrees mm -hmm. and maybe emphasis, but I think it is what it is. I mean, it's, 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 it's it stayed true all these years. I think it's not going to change. It's just that maybe the perspective of where the best place to invest your money is to get the biggest bang for the buck might change a little bit. It might change the type of information you give them. Mm -hmm. If they want data where people are working from home, there's a different way of communicating that. They might need no, different resources, which is the second variable. See yeah. what I mean? But, yeah, this was going to be where my questions like from this came. And I think um, you both did such a good job of presenting it because that was going to be my question specifically, not only post pandemic, mm -hmm. but like transitioning to remote or hybrid environments. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like with what you're presenting, I was like, no, I think it's the same. I think we, you know, I'd be curious if there'd be any change in like compensation or recognition. Um, that's just something anecdote like i'm just seeing a little bit more of but um very very interested in this i, I, I gotta tell you yeah oh go ahead i'm sorry kate go ahead well i mean we were talking about this earlier and i think in the business world looking at this framework and understanding the different areas i think the one that i could perceive being a change is capacity and resources because a lot of industries in the business world are so used to being so lean now because of the pandemic that the way individuals look at their environment has completely changed you know yeah and so as much as they would love to say that 
it is the same, I think, because they're not truly tapping in to their employees and really doing those check-ins and ensuring that they have the resources. I think that's the only thing that might have a slight change because the business in itself has not taken care of the people. Yeah, that's right. The mindset hasn't changed. But again, as a manager, management support was the big issue that we had there. They don't have the data to understand how they need to start thinking differently. And I think that mindset shift in training the management at that level of them understanding this model and creating the resources for them to be educated from the top down, how impactful that is when in reality we want to train employees and assume that managers already have all that they need because they have those titles, I think that's where we have a huge detriment in mm -hmm. any, you know, just automatically assuming that everyone has that competency is not necessarily fair because information is number one, right? Like <laughs> we're saying the education, the training, the competencies, the all of this is most number one to show that you can perform at any title. But if we're lacking in that, how do you answer that call when you want to make great shifts? Yeah, I, I got to tell you, when I was first introduced to the, the, the results of the study, when Frank asked me to be a part of the, uh, writing this paper, when I looked at it, I said, this is powerful. This is a very, very powerful study because, you know, we can be myopic in the West when we say that this works over here in the industries where we are, okay? But when you take a look at an emergency power like China and the potential that they have over there and you know, the quality of work that's coming out of there is just phenomenal. Like, uh, you know, Frank was talking about the different awards that uh, different companies in China are applying for ISP. I, I approved one this morning as I read through it. It was the best one I read over U.S., written from the U.S., okay? Government agencies in the U.S. Um, so, you know, they, they, got, they got their act together over there on this. They really do. And to see that the the assumptions and and the data supports China as well, but with a slightly different emphasis, that gives you all kinds of new insights, a different perspective. So I think I think it's a powerful study. You know, Tim, you you uh, piqued my interest here with this post pandemic question. Um, my son in law is a patent attorney in a large uh, firm in Boston. And I would say probably within the last six months, uh, management has been encouraging their workers to come back to the office. And many of the workers do not want to come back to the office because they believe that they are more productive uh, working from their own home office. Um, so what would be interesting is to uh, run a study with the numbers, you know, that could be presented to management mm -hmm. as to whether, um, you know, bringing everybody back to the office would actually be best for the profitability of the firm. Yeah. Yeah. I know ROI Institute did a study on that question with a, I think it was an insurance company that was looking at going green, trying to reduce emissions and things and having more people work from home. And the question they had was, well, how's that going to affect our bottom line? You know, mm -hmm. what's going to be the return on that investment? And um, they, they did a study on, they found that it had a positive ROI for the organization to do that. And it did not affect productivity at all. Now, one of the problems that you have with people when they work from home is they don't walk away from the desk. Mm -hmm. you know I can I mean? tell you that that's my son-in-law. Yeah, from an anecdotal yeah. standpoint. Well, that's like you know, I was sitting here at my desk doing work and doing some things like that, and all of a sudden I looked up and said, "Oh, I got to do, I got to do a presentation." <laughs> right, right. So he has been uh, going into the office one day a week and then going networking one day of week, one day a week. Yeah. Um, and then you know the other three days he spends at his desk at home. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah. Donna, you got a great point there is looking at it 
redoing this these types of studies in this new environment because people are working from home now they're going to say i got to come back to work and people are asking why we've already proven i can do the work from yes. home right i mean his compensation has been enormous you know post pandemic uh, than it was pre pandemic yep yep right. I think it's very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, research topic to look at uh, after pandemic uh, as more people work from home. And uh, my prediction, my personal prediction, I don't know whether it's, you agree or not, is that uh, when most people or more people work from home, that make the environmental factors even more important. That's right. Uh, think about data, the information, the feedback, you know, when we work from home, what is the challenge we are facing? Is what is the expectation for my managers? You know, mm -hmm. can I catch catch up with my colleagues? So it's mm -hmm. hard for the individual to get the data. So that make data even more important. The mm -hmm. second factor is the tools, the resources. You know, we rely so much on the communication tools like the Zoom meeting. You know, we don't have that before the pandemic. Now every day we are having Zoom meetings. So I think the 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 second uh, factor, instrument, resource, and the tools are important. So it's my my if I have to develop some hypotheses, obviously after pandemic, with more people working from home, the data, the instrument will be more important. That be that be my uh, prediction. So it's and a very interesting topic. The incentives too, also because people are going to be more mobile working at, you know, being able to work from home, that means they can work from home for any company anywhere in the world. So an organization has got to keep have incentives that make them want to stay at that organization or they get recruited away. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's really interesting out there. You know, it's interesting because I was thinking about the Jetsons didn't do a very good job of predicting this because the Jetsons, they had Zoom because they could talk over TVs and things like that to each other. But George Jetson still had to go to Spacely Sprockets to sit at a desk. What was that about? Yeah. Well, they missed the boat on that one. <laughs> I think that that is a really good point, but I think also to do on some like future intake because most jobs, I know for myself, I have to physically go back in permanently for a set amount of days per week, and that's mandatory. And I would say that even looking at it from one of our largest on the Western side, one of our largest employers is the federal government. And now mm -hmm. that has been for us to go back in to the offices because they have seen a reduction in the economy of certain larger cities. But yeah. at the same time, that's a resource environmental impact, right? But yeah. even with that, not impacting the employee per se because they're saving money on gas. Because if you know what it's like to drive in the Washington, D.C. area, a 20-minute yeah, commute, actually two I hours. Do. That's <laughs> right. So that's essentially, <laughs> exactly. and so when you really look at it, what is what is the benefit, you know, that the employee is having truly? And I think there has been some kind of offset research, not necessarily scholarly or peered, but like city data that is available in terms of like the economic impact. There has mm -hmm. been some research specific agencies on their processes and, you know, whether or not they truly have been more productive. Um, I think they will say overarching, mm -hmm. yes, we've been productive, we can do the work, but like depending on the type of work that they do, has their actual systems and processes slowed down or has it increased? And those are things that we haven't really identified. So I think it's really good if we work to look at it from a post-pandemic, more so on the hybrid than just the virtual, because that is going to be the. I, I, yeah, and I think you know this study that uh, was done, um, that Frank and his team did, is is something that's going that we could try to bring to our organizations to show the value of our profession, to answer those types of questions give them data so they can make data-driven decisions. And we've got a track record here of going back from Gilbert's original work in 78 all the way through in various studies. And now, you know, we got global studies that bring, you know, to support this. 
go forth and do it likewise. You know, there's nothing that says you can't do this yourself. So if there's a, if there's something you want to do, you want to try to do it in your organization, you know, contact Frank and I, and we'll be happy to help. And, you know, we'll see what we could do to get this going because we want to continue to advance the profession, our, our human performance technology profession. And I think that we, we, we haven't done as good a job as we could to be able to show the value that we bring. So with that, I think we got two minutes left according to my clock. So, Kay, do you want to bring this to a close if nobody have, else has any questions? Sure. I mean, truly, I appreciate everyone for logging into the session today. Um, Dr. Brock and Dr. Fo, I appreciate you presenting the study that you both have truly worked tirelessly on, as well as Dr. Yee, who is not here, but we will give him as much credit as possible, or her as much credit as possible. Um, and I want to thank everyone who has uh, shown up. We will be planning another session next quarter, and you will see that information on our website soon, um, as well as we appreciate all the comments as well as questions and answers that have been provided to us. If you have um, access to our website, you will see this recording with the presentation as well as the originating study so that you can follow up on it. Um, I know we have some alum on here as well as some active members. So please don't forget to complete our survey as well because we really wanna serve you as your new student leaders um, here at the Capella ISPI. And thank you once again, Dr. Brock and Dr. Phil. Absolutely. Thank you. Everybody thank you. Volunteer in the chapter. Get involved with yes. ISPI. I'm a member. Hang out with us, <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. We're good people. <laughs> Thank y'all. I will um, stop recording at this point. Um.